Now, today's uh, lecture is going to cover a very large expanse of church history, about 281 years. We're going to begin approximately at the year 30 A.D. at the founding of the church and go all the way up to the year 311 when Christianity was legalized in the state in the Roman Empire. Understand it was not then the national religion, but it was at least legalized. So we're going to look at the church at the time when it was a band of outlaws, when the people of God could not meet without fear of molestation, arrest, and oftentimes much worse. We're going to look then at the age between about 30 A.D. to 311 A.D. And the headings of this talk are really four. Number one, we're going to look at the expansion of Christianity during that period of time, and it was quite remarkable. Secondly, we're going to mark the character of the early church. Thirdly, we'll see the persecutions of the early church. And then lastly, we'll note perhaps the strangest of all, the attraction of the early church. It's amazing, isn't it, that a group of outlaws, men who were called everything under heaven that could be thought of to besmirch their characters, yet were mightily attractive to the Roman citizens of the empire. And then we'll conclude today with just a few observations on how this relates to the present time. So having said that by way of introduction, I want you to note then in the first place the expansion of Christianity. The Christian church traces its origin to the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, who in calling men to follow him began building a church against which the gates of hell would not prevail. His success in numerical terms was remarkably small. For even though multitudes flocked to him and thousands professedly believed on him, only a handful were genuinely loyal to the Savior. Fifty days after his death, only 120 could be found in all of Jerusalem who dared own his cause. They were meeting one day in an upper room for prayer when the Holy Spirit descended upon them in power. His work was transforming in its effects. For Peter, who but eight weeks earlier had denied the Lord for fear of a girl, now appears before an enormous crowd of men which included those who had conspired for Jesus' execution and proclaims this crucified criminal both Lord and Christ. Overpowered by guilt, his hearers shouted, Men and brethren, uh, what shall we do? To which Peter answered, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Relieved that there was forgiveness in the murdered Christ, about 3,000 were added to the church that day. From that time on, the church would be a force to be reckoned with, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, in Samaria, and finally in the uttermost parts of the earth. The gospel was next carried to Samaria by Philip the Evangelist, who was also a deacon in the church of Jerusalem. He preached Christ to the degraded Samaritans, who, with near unanimity, gave heed to the things which he spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Learning of the good news from Jerusalem, Peter and John traveled north to inspect the work of their friend. Being satisfied with the faith of the Samaritans, they laid hands on the new converts who thereby received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thus, from its earliest age, the church's international character became evident. Then, one of the strangest things in history occurred. A devout Italian soldier by the name of Cornelius was praying one day when an angel appeared to him, telling him to send for a na man named Simon Peter who was then residing in the home of Simon the Tanner at Joppa. Being obedient to the heavenly vision, Peter was duly called. While all this was happening, Peter was having an extraordinary dream in which Christ was commanding him to eat unclean food, an idea repugnant to any self-respecting Jew. Some closing advice was then given in the dream, which Peter would mull over for four days. What God has cleansed, let no man call unclean. That was a surprising thing, wasn't it? To these men who, for so many years, had believed certain things to be unclean. 
Well, when Peter was thinking over what this dream could mean, a knock came at the door of Simon the Tanner. And a couple of men, a couple of servants of Cornelius, asked if Peter could be persuaded to come to their home, to the home of their master. Agreeing to their proposal, he comes to Cornelius' house and for the first time in his life steps into a Gentile home. There Cornelius recites to him what this angel had told him and begs Peter to preach the gospel to him and to those who had assembled in his house. This he does, and sometime in the middle of his sermon, the Holy Spirit falls upon the whole congregation who had met there, astounding Peter and his Jewish friends that they too had received the Holy Spirit as the Jews had before them. Needless to say, Peter and his Jewish friends were astounded that God had granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. From that day forward, Christianity would no longer be a sect of Judaism, but chiefly found among the Gentiles. Although others would carry the word abroad, the bulk of the work would fall upon the broad shoulders of Paul, who would become, in the words of Isaiah, a light to the Gentiles, that he should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul's work, you know, is amply documented in the book of Acts as well as in his epistles. Suffice it to say that he, along with his various traveling companions, carried the gospel and founded churches throughout the Mediterranean basin, which includes Asia Minor. That's what we presently call Turkey. Some of its leading cities were Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, Troas, at Ephesus. He also carried it to the Balkan Peninsula, present day Greece and its northern neighbors. Some of the names on this peninsula you will doubtless recognize Athens, Corinth, Berea, Thessalonica, and Philippi. The Mediterranean islands of Cyprus, Crete, Malta, and Sicily also received the light, as did the eternal city of Rome. Thus, by the death of Paul, about 64 A.D., the gospel had spread, in his own words, to the ends of the earth. The religion, therefore, crucified in weakness, lived by the power of God. The acts of the apostles are now over, but the work of the glorified Lord had just begun, and it's to this post-scriptural work that I now turn your attention. The amazing growth of the church as recorded in the New Testament was, believe it or not, sustained for the next 250 years with but one exception, that is of course the Jews, whose house was left desolate to them in fulfillment of the prophecy of the weeping Savior. Everywhere else, however, men eagerly embraced the gospel of love. At the death of Paul, Christianity, however, was but on the periphery of public opinion. Most Romans had either never heard of it or dismissed it as nothing more than a new sect of Judaism. But soon it would be on everyone's mind as a new revolutionary faith advancing with irresistible power. Between the year 64, which was the time when Paul died, and 311 when it was legalized, the church sustained phenomenal growth, both in its extent and in its popularity. This Galilean sect soon spread over the whole known world, going as far east as India, as far west as Britain, penetrating into Germany to the north, and deep into the bowels of Africa. But you should not think that just a handful met at each location, for in fact, multitudes flocked to the churches everywhere. Tertullian died 220, taunted the pagans thusly, quote, we are a people of yesterday, and yet we have filled every place belonging to you. Cities, islands, castles, towns, assemblies, your very camp, your tribes, companies, palace, senate, forum. We leave you your temples only. We can count your armies. Our numbers in a single province will be greater. Now this old father may have been using hyperbole for effect, but his point was undeniable. Christians were multiplying in the empire like the Hebrews in Egypt. How do you suppose such a remarkable expansion was being carried out? Interestingly, here we find a break with the New Testament pattern. 
If you go back and read the New Testament, you'll see that the Gospel generally was carried abroad by specially appointed missionaries, in particular the Apostle Paul. These were the men who did the pioneer work of the Gospel. But, oddly enough, after the death of Paul, and for the next 250 years, not a single prominent missionary is noted in church history. That's fascinating, isn't it? Apologists are known. Bishops are known. Heretics are known. Deacons are known. Women are known. Martyrs. All kinds of other people are well known. But nowhere in the next 250 years do you find a single Remarkable individual called a missionary. For in fact, the good word was spread abroad by ordinary people. Housewives, soldiers, school children, who like the Jerusalem saints before them, went everywhere preaching the word. Christ therefore again brought to nothing the things that are by the things that are not. Astonishing thought, isn't it? Rome, with its deified emperor, venerable senate, battery of philosophers, an invincible army, brought to its knees by farmers, carpenters, ditch diggers, and slaves. And so the, this first epic of church history fulfilled the ancient prophecy, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who published it. And so we find in this first epic of church history about 281 years, a remarkable expansion of the church, growing from a tiny sect of Jews all huddled in, in, a, in an upper room in Jerusalem to a universal religion filling the whole Roman Empire. But what kind of people were they? What was the character of this early church? Well, I have three or four different things I need to say to you with reference to their character. They were marked in the first place by a genuine holiness of life. The ancient empire, like the modern West, was a sinking ship on which everyone aboard was grabbing one last pleasure before drowning. Everyone, that is, but the Christians. They avoided not only the obvious sins of idolatry, fornication, murder, and so on, but prevailing fashions of the day as well. A man, for example, would be excommunicated for attending the gladiatorial games. Luxury, covetousness, sternly condemned. One man put it this way, The Lord Jesus did not come down from heaven with a silver foot bath to wash the disciples' feet. Another, criticizing excess of dress, wrote, If God had wished purple clothes, He would have made purple sheep. Tertullian said, A neck adorned with a necklace would never submit to the acts of an executioner. In short, they lived simply, refusing the typical vainglory of the world. They were deeply concerned, furthermore, for the welfare of their children, and so withdrew them from public schools where the idolatrous Virgil and Homer were taught and formed their own academies where a world and life view could be taught consistent with the gospel. But their holiness was more than a negation. It was more than some kind of rigorous legalism summed up in the words, touch not, taste not, handle not. For they demanded a positive righteousness as well. The one law of Christ which was most sternly enforced in the churches was love your enemies, a duty they had plenty of opportunity to fulfill. One anecdote of the possession of these people will illustrate the compassion they owned. Abortion was very common in the empire, but of course technology was quite primitive and therefore many women were unsuccessful in aborting their children and often bore mutilated babies. Not having quite the heart to murder the child herself, she would go to a designated field and abandon the baby to die of exposure or to be eaten by wild animals. Christians, rather than just deploring this awful act of uh, murder, would often hide in these fields and when the infants were left, quickly seize them and bring them up as their own. And so these were a holy people marked both by the negatives, the not doing wrong, 
and also by the positives fulfilling the law of Christ. But they were more than just holy, they were also zealous. As previously mentioned, Christianity was spread throughout the empire by ordinary believers without the use of professional missionaries, organized campaigns, or anything else. And if you've ever tried to witness to people and bring them to the knowledge of Christ, you know it requires real zeal to do that on a consistent, day-by-day basis. Well, they had it. They were also sincere in their faith. At that time, like now, most people were nominally religious. Maybe they went to meetings, said prayers, and so on, but really didn't believe anything. The Christians did. In a letter to the Emperor Trajan, Pliny, a Roman governor, wrote, Christians are incapable of cursing Christ. That, of course, is not absolutely true, but the point was they were very sincere in what they believed. They didn't just take on a a nominal profession of the faith and live as however they pleased. They were sincere. And fourthly, they were fearless. During some periods, martyrdom was the rule, not the exception. Until 311 AD, no Christian was ever entirely safe in the Roman Empire. Not one day went by without at least some threat of persecution, exile, or worse. These believers, of course, were not perfect. A few of them denied Christ under duress. Others, no doubt, became self-righteous. Husbands and wives didn't get along perfectly in those days either. But as a rule, they were marked by a high regard for real, vigorous, and consistent holiness. Why were they so exemplary in their behavior? Obviously, because God sanctified them by His Spirit. But other factors must be considered as well. Persecution kept hypocrites out of the church. It set God's people to watching and praying. Because even one traitor could expose the church, careful oversight was practiced. But most importantly, these brethren evidently believed that the gospel which had rescued them from idolatry, immorality, and damnation ought to be more than believed. It ought to be adorned. And so that's, in short, the character of these early brethren. Now, being a people who loved their neighbors, who abstained from fleshly lusts, who picked up abandoned children, of course, brought down upon them the most violent persecutions. Strange, isn't it? You'd think they'd receive the admiration of the world. But in fact, such behavior provoked nothing but wrath from both the government officials and also the rank-and-file citizens of that empire. Interesting, isn't it? Although Christians were in many ways model citizens, they were frequently and severely persecuted. The charges laid against them were many, some of which were obviously absurd. You remember the legend, don't you, that Nero fiddled while Rome burned? Many people in Rome at the time thought that Nero had started the fire just because he was a wicked man. But in order to uh, avoid the blame uh, being laid upon himself, he blamed the Christians. An absurd charge if there ever was one. And of course, sometimes the ungodly attended a a meeting in which the church uh, partook of the Lord's Supper. And whenever they heard the minister say, take, eat, this is my body, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of sins and so forth, they twisted these perfectly innocent words and said... Those people are cannibals. They were accused of eating their own children, incredibly. Which is most interesting since they rescued uh, abandoned babies that the pagans had left. They became scapegoats for every ill. Again, Tertullian writes, If the river Tiber rises as high as the city walls of Rome... If the river Nile does not send its waters over the fields, if there is an earthquake or famine or pestilence, immediately the cry is, the Christians to the lions. And so all kinds of opprobrium, all sorts of evil, silly and foolish charges were laid to their account. But did you know that even the more thoughtful Roman was troubled by the existence of Christianity? Even those men who knew good and well that they didn't eat their children and start fires and so forth. Even the very moderate, um, open-minded, rather liberal Roman wasn't very comfortable with Christians 
in his vicinity. Now, if this fellow were religious, he'd say, these people deny the gods of Rome, therefore they are atheists. And of course, when they don't offer their sacrifices to the gods, when they don't praise the genius of Caesar and so forth, these gods become angry and visit us with dreadful pestilences. And so the reason there's an earthquake, the reason there's a flood, the reason there's a drought, the reason there's a fire, or any of these other acts of God is obviously because the gods are angry at us because these no-good Christians won't honor them as they should. Not so unreasonable, is it? It's not insanity, is it? It makes a lot of sense if you begin with the presupposition there are many gods who have to be pleased. The secular-minded Roman didn't care much for them either. He didn't care if they were atheists or not. He just considered them to be subversive to the state, undermining its stability. Here's why. The empire had to be held together by some trait common among all of its inhabitants. But which one? Customs, languages, laws, and religions differed radically between the provinces. So an easy one was chosen, which was simple to perform, could be done hypocritically, yet was necessary to the cohesion of the empire. Say two words. I don't care if you believe it or not. Kyrios Kaiser. Caesar is Lord. Go home and worship any god you want to. Make any sacrifice that pleases you. But say two words. Caesar is Lord. Two words in, in the language. The Christians wouldn't do it. They kept saying Kyrios Christos. Christ is the Lord. Therefore, even though they paid their taxes to Caesar, prayed for him, honored his positions, his position, they were considered traitors to the state, and traitors, of course, have to go. And so ten persecutions were leveled against the church. Some were limited and random, such as those launched by Nero. He's the lion, by the way, out of whose mouth Paul was delivered and Caligula, who was one of the greatest perverts of all time. Others, however, were extensive and systematic, interestingly enough, under the reigns of the two most enlightened emperors, uh, Marcus Aurelius and Septimus Severus. No atrocity was too cruel for the Christians. The most common, you might know, burning, being thrown to the lions, put in a ring with a gladiator, beheading, and of course the ever-popular crucifixion. Of the dozens of recorded martyrdoms, I'll only mention two, just to give you a general idea of what was done to these brethren and how they stood firm against it. And I'm choosing two people who are in many respects on the opposite ends of the spectrum. One is Polycarp, the other is Perpetua. Polycarp was martyred in the year 168. Who was he? Well, he was a student of John the Apostle. He was a bishop of Smyrna. He was about a hundred years old. He was indicted for being a Christian and encouraging others to convert. An officer came to his door and um, arrested him. But the officer had walked a very long way and Polycarp could see that he was obviously hungry so incredibly he offered his arrestor a meal before they left. Being overcome by the kindness of this holy pastor, the officer allowed this man to have a few minutes or perhaps an hour or two to pray. And there he prayed for himself. He prayed for his church. He prayed for the man who was arresting him. He prayed for those who would doubtless kill him. He prayed for the emperor and all men in general. He then came to the officer and was ready to go. He was taken to the amphitheater and commanded to deny Christ and swear by Caesar's genius. Interestingly enough, if I throw this in as a sideline, the emperor's genius is identical to the idea of the Japanese worshipping uh, the, the emperor. It's kind of a spiritual idea. They don't worship a body. They worship the spirit of the emperor, which is eternal. The Romans did exactly the same thing. They said, worship the spirit of the emperor and deny Christ. And he answered this thusly, I have now served my Lord Jesus Christ for 86 years, and he has never done me any harm. How can I deny my king who hath hitherto preserved me from all evil and so faithfully redeemed me? So, 
he would not deny Christ. Then thinking that perhaps he could be threatened in the denial, he was threatened with wild beasts, to which he said, Let them come, for my purpose is unchangeable. We Christians cannot be converted from good to evil by affliction, but it would be better if they who persist in their wickedness would become converted to that which is good. Fire was then threatened, to which he answered, You threaten me with the fire that will soon go out, but you do not know the fire of God which is prepared for the everlasting punishment of the ungodly. But why are you delaying? Bring on the beast or the fire or whatever you choose. You shall not move me to deny Christ my Lord and Savior. His request was granted and he was very slowly burned to death. The other example of martyrdom occurred in the year 203. That's about 35 years later. And the martyr was named Perpetua. Perpetua was a young woman about 20 years old from one of the first families of Rome. She also had a newborn babe on her breast. When she became a Christian, she was soon discovered and arrested and brought to the amphitheater to also be killed. The leader of the games asked her to recant, to deny Christ openly, to swear by the genius of Caesar, and all would be well. She refused his threat. Her parents then came to her. Remember, she was just a young woman herself, 20 years old about. Her parents came to her and literally got down on their knees and begged her to not bring this disgrace upon the family name. They were one of the most prominent clans in the city of Rome, loving Christ more than father or mother. And then perhaps the cruelest thing was done. The baby was torn off her breast and uh, she was told, if you don't deny Christ, this baby will be orphaned and you'll never see him grow up. She still would not deny. And the man then carried the baby away. And as the baby was being carried away from his mother, he started crying very loudly, which caused, what do you think to happen? Milk to come down into her breasts. And now with breasts aching for her crying baby, she was thrown to the lions, which in turn devoured her. And so it was no easy thing to be a Christian in this, these first three centuries after the coming of the Lord. But interestingly enough, the cruel persecution did not retard the growth of the church. Indeed, the words of the Father were true. The blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. And so, after 250 years of brutal repression, Rome found more Christians on its hands than ever before. For such a faith naturally attracts the attention and admiration of every thinking man, which brings me to my final point, the attraction of the early church. Despite what their critics alleged, early Christianity was not confined to one class of people. It cut across every ethnic, social, and economic line. Slaves and masters met at the Lord's table together. The races, leaving their inherited prejudices, received one another into a common assembly. That the lowest classes were brought into the church is admitted by all, but so were men of wealth and education. No illiterate ever wrote with the subtlety and grace of adjusted martyr, Origen, or Tertullian. And so the church at that time was made up of all kinds of people. The enemies, a man named Celsus, said the only kind of people who go to those churches are slaves, illiterates, women, lowest of the low. But nothing could be further from the truth. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to every kind of human. Now, to descend into particulars, Christianity was most attractive to various peoples, only four of which I'll presently mention. First, it was very attractive, interestingly enough, to the intellectual elite, for it provided a consistent world and life view. You know, an ever-changing life cannot be understood without an unchanging constant. But the Roman and local gods were like men always changing, changing, 
while Jehovah is immutable and therefore provides an infallible point of reference by which to judge everything that goes on in this loud and uh, boisterous world. And so men who were sick and tired of the sliding standards of morality and who couldn't take much more of the various gods who were always quarreling with each other and whose power was really not even precisely defined and so forth. They'd grown tired of this crazy, fragmented view of life and adopted Christianity. It was also appealing to the middle class person. He, like the middle class person of today, was exhausted by materialism and pleasure seeking. He grew sick of life. The rate of suicide in Imperial Rome was incredibly high, many times higher than our present rate. But the gospel, of course, gives meaning to life and hope for the life to come. Therefore, it energized the working man as well. It was exalting to the slave, too. You know, a slave at the time was often thought of as nothing more than an ox, a horse, or some other animal intended to please his master. But the gospel came along and said, the slave of man is the free man of Christ. And it told the slave, you too are created in the likeness and the image of God. And therefore, although economically you may be below your master, you share equal dignity with him. And his work was not pointless either. If his master was just a, just a cruel and silly man, he might have him digging ditches and filling them in day after day. But his work was not futile because in doing the most menial labor, what was he doing? He was serving the Lord Christ. And so many slaves came to the faith. Onesimus is one in the Bible. And perhaps most interestingly, the gospel was very uplifting to women. Never let anyone tell you that Christianity degrades women. It does just the opposite. But by denying them one role in life, it gives them another for which they are divinely suited. Now, how did Christianity have a practical effect on the lives of these Roman women? Well, first of all, it prohibited adultery. If you read it all in the classics, you know that the classical man was just assumed to have a mistress. He had sexual intercourse with his wife to have children. He had sexual intercourse with his mistress to have fun. Simple as that. It was assumed. Everybody did it. There was no stigma attached to it. But when the gospel came in and said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, flee fornication, then wives didn't have to worry about where their husbands were every night. But it went a lot farther than that. It also told the husband things like, Your body does not belong to you, but to your wife. It told the man that your wife is an heir together of the grace of life with you. It commanded him to love her as Christ loved the church. And therefore it was most uplifting to women. But when you come down to the bottom line, you just have to put it this way. When the Son of Man is lifted up, He draws all kinds of men to Himself. Now let me me conclude today on this uh, lecture of early Christianity by just making a few observations which seem to me to tie this subject in to the present time. Number one, we are in an age remarkably similar to the early church. Under the guise of religious toleration, the state is usurping to itself more and more power over religion. If you don't think so, spank your children in public and find out what happens. If you don't think so, then homeschool your children and see a truant officer knock on your door. If you don't think so, let me introduce you to some men who simply wanted to teach their children in a Christian school without the state's credential. The state, therefore, is usurping to itself more and more power over religion. If unchecked by divine grace, this will eventually, and perhaps sooner than you think, lead to the intensified persecution of God's people. Such tyranny, amazingly, will be condoned by your very thoughtful, moderate, but unregenerate neighbors. Nominal Christians will submit to it, and like the apostates of old, say publicly, Caesar is Lord. Then go home and pray to Christ in their closet. Number two, 
Genuine Christians, however, will retain their God-given rights to worship the Lord as their own consciences dictate. They will therefore become objects of ridicule, legal harassment, and perhaps more. But if these Christians remain faithful to the end, then Christ will give them a crown of life. And the powers of today that resist the Lord will eventually find themselves where Rome is now, on the scrap heap of history. For at his death, Julian the Apostate, who hoped to exterminate Christianity and bring back paganism with a vengeance, cried, Thou hast triumphed, O Galilean. For the Christ who smashed the greatest empire in history will grind to powder all upon whom he falls. But not only are the dangers of today comparable to those of Rome, but our opportunities are as well. The fact of the matter is, modern man is burned out with what the world has to offer, no matter what he says about it. Think about, historically, in the last hundred years, perhaps two hundred years would be better, and remember all the messiahs that have risen up in the last two hundred years that were going to just sweep the world into paradise. 1858, Darwin publishes The Origin of the Species and the, uh, the Ascent of Man. And, this, and through him and through Huxley and through other men, it was said that science would soon revolutionize the world and usher in a golden age. But what has science provided? It's provided the hydrogen bomb, hasn't it? Dr. Oppenheimer, the uh, world-renowned nuclear physicist, who actually worked on the atomic bomb. When he, was, when he saw its first detonation in New Mexico, he knew that his whole life in science had been wasted. Like Frankenstein, he had created a monster. People nowadays do not believe in science. Understandably so. The Enlightenment broke into France in the 18th century. And the apostles of the Enlightenment, men like Voltaire and Rousseau and other people, they said that by mere reason alone, we'll usher in the millennium. We'll get rid of all these religions, all of this tradition, all of this nonsense which has tied men in knots for these centuries, and by reason alone, we'll go into the millennium. It promised fair, but it delivered foul, didn't it? The French Revolution, promising the equality and fraternity of all men, soon degenerated into the reign of terror, in which men, all men were equal in the sense that all men were liable to go to the guillotine, and literal brothers were at the throats of one another. That's where reason has gotten us. Reason, therefore, no longer appeals to men. Karl Marx said, Politics! will make a new man. But his utopian dreams are this very hour being shattered on the fields of Eastern Europe. Politics no longer appeal. Wealth is always a delight. And it allows for the leisurely appropriation of pleasure. And so, some people have thought that if we can just get enough wealth, we'll be satisfied, we'll have an easy life, we don't have to put our noses to the grindstone and work day and night. I ask you, what age has had more leisure time than ours? And yet, if you go to the man on the street, will he be satisfied with his life? Does he find any meaning in his life? A man a hundred years ago worked 60 or, eight, 60 or 70 hours a week. Now he works 40. But what does he do with the extra time? He worries. And now he has so much money, he can buy nearly anything he wants and do anything he pleases. But now, our friends from the scientific community tell us that all the things we so much wanted to buy with our money and do in our spare time will kill us in the end. Can't smoke. Can't drink. Can't use drugs. Better not have sex. Don't even lie out in the sun if you want to stay alive. And so all the pleasures of life which could be purchased through 
uh, the money that buys our leisure time has disappointed too. Why? I read somewhere that even television sets emit a radiation that can kill you. Interesting, isn't it? And so Solomon knew whereof he spoke and was really describing our age when he said, Vanity of vanity, all is vanity, says the preacher. So you know in one way it's a great blessing that we live in such a pessimistic age because people are not pinning their hopes on science or reason or wealth or politics anymore. They're just withdrawing into an existential world of meaninglessness. And therefore there's a great opportunity to bring to men and women and children the gospel which comes down from heaven that gives meaning to life, that makes life more meaningful than simply having enough money to live, going on expensive vacations, and so forth. Therefore, this world, like the world of old, is crying out for help, which only a full, consistent gospel adorned by godly lives can answer. Then my third observation is this. You can, by God's grace, make a difference in the world. Remember, please, the remarkable expansion of Christianity was carried out not by missionaries, but by farmers and housewives. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Holiness of life is the best witness to the reality of your religion. These Christians were not believed because their doctrine seemed to make more sense than anyone else's doctrines. Because if you start at any, if you start at any given presupposition, any system makes sense. But even though the gospel itself and the word of the cross seemed foolishness to the Greek and weakness to the Roman, the holiness of these people's lives demonstrated it was nothing less than the power of God. Athanasius, who appeared at the Council of Nicaea, made an argument for the truth of religion this way. When asked why he believed that Christ had been raised from the dead, he said, Do you think a dead man could revolutionize lives like Christ does? Number five, briefly, purifying the church is the key to church growth. The Puritan said it is not want of numbers. It is not want of numbers, but want of holiness that hinders the church. I'll anticipate just for a moment. The church after 311 became worldly all of the leading citizens went into the church. Many of them occupied uh, offices of great importance. And what happens? The church grew by leaps and bounds incredibly in numbers as all kinds of unconverted people came into it, but it lost its power. One sharp point is better than the largest blunt object. Six, never fear persecution. It will only make you a better Christian. God will establish you all right, but only after you've suffered a while. And lastly, never be ashamed of the gospel, for in a world like ours or Rome's, it remains the only power of God unto salvation. May God bless these words for our edification. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, please bless these words. Thank you for strengthening these brethren of old. Use their example to encourage us to hope in the future. Amen.